the Journey series. I welcome you all to this fascinating idea of connecting patients and family by Skype and video streaming. This is very exciting. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you for those connected from home. I say hi. <laughs> And I'm Dr. Daniele Salinas. I'm one of the cystic fibrosis physicians here at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Um, we have here Dr. Tom Kings. He is our CHLA CF Center Director. Thank you, Tom, for being here. <laughs> the idea behind any cystic fibrosis event is to share information and knowledge so you can make your lives better. However, this concept of sharing information in person for patients have been restricted for many years because we're all more aware of the risks of cross-contamination among uh, patients with cystic fibrosis. So as infection control policies become more strict, we want to make sure that patients and families are not isolated and that we are creating other opportunities for, for you to connect with one another. So this is, this is the goal. So the, actually, the first event in the Journey series was on um, March 9th. It was at Miller Children's Hospital. And Jill and Julia did a fantastic job organizing the event. Um, it was focused on <coughs> going to college. So they had a representative from um, the disability office, um, from the uh, community college, and UC Irvine talking about resources. They had real patients and families. Um, sharing their experience of this process of choosing a college or even not, to, not going to college. So I think it was extremely relevant for those uh, going through the same dilemmas and the same uh, issues. I think it was a really valid event. Today's event, the focus will be on self-care with cystic fibrosis, mapping your own adventure. So this is you know, how you um, own your disease. How do you own your disease? How do you embrace this diagnosis? And how do you take care of your health independently and still live your life and enjoy and be happy? So we're hoping to bring up some uh, important topics, things that you might be going through as a patient and as a family. Open the discussion so we can have a better understanding of what's going on at home. And most importantly, find solutions. It's never too early or too late to start thinking about becoming more independent. So I'd like to thank Michelle Faust from Vertex First for the idea and the encouragement to put this event together. Um, Hiram gave us the opportunity to meet uh, Kristen McFowl, who works for them and who will be here uh, later today sharing her experience. So she, I'm sorry to disclose her age, but she's a 42-year-old with uh, cystic fibrosis, and she has a great story uh, to, to share with us. And then others came on board to make this day possible, including Abvi, Gilead, CF Services, Electromed, Genentech, Novartis, and Risperdtec. Um, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation is also here. So the chapters of LA County and Orange County, they have been very instrumental in ideas um, for the technology and how to make this work, and also very instrumental in promoting this event. So I'll thank you all um, for the support and to make this possible. So please go outside and visit their booths, and uh, during the break and at the end, we'll have some time. So thank you all. We have an exciting program ahead of us. Uh, we'll start with um, exploring the models of poor adherence and strategies to overcome barriers. And then we'll have a fun moment with Javier, Sophia, and Kim. They'll be playing a skit of a common day in the day of, a, of the life of a CF family. So this will be, this will be uh, hopefully a fun time. And this will lead to Dr. Um, to Dr. Laura Bava's presentation. She is our um, a, a pediatric psychologist here at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. And she will be talking about opportunities for positive change and, um, and uh, <laughs> opportunities for project change and, and, um, and in that. Um, so then we'll have the break, the break group session. So this is really your opportunity to vent and share what you're going through, what you're going through at home. So please don't be shy. 
participate, ask questions, and, and this will be, you know, we're gonna stand up and go to the, to the back tables and we'll have those uh, group discussions. Um, we are here to help, we're here to listen and, and be helpful. So the more you participate, this will be more relevant to what you're going through at home. So this is the time. I encourage people from home to ask questions as well. So if you go to your, the bottom left of your screen, there will be an opportunity, there will be a little box where you can uh, type in your questions and Kim will be here and she can read your questions out loud. So she is moderating this part. And if, we're, if you're connected by Skype, that's even easier because we can hear and see you. So you can basically literally just raise your hand and, um, and we have an avatar here who is going to um, be, you know, your hands and legs and voice. So she would direct the microphone every time you have a question. And that goes for after each presentation and it goes for, you know, the group discussion. So this, take advantage of that. So then we'll have a little break and, um, and then we'll resume with Kristen McFowl who is visiting us from Denver. So we're very thrilled to have her here and sharing her story. And then we will uh, have Kim Morris talking about transition readiness. How do you take, how do you transition to adult care, you know, when you're a teenager? So this will be an important topic to discuss. And then Liz Filmar will conclude the program with um, fun um, ideas to exercise that it will improve your health. So she will share her experience with yoga and she, along with Whitney, will demonstrate some breathing exercises and some yoga poses that you can actually start doing it today and do it at home and start doing it, you know, tomorrow. So those things that can improve your, your health. So this is very exciting. I hope you're all ready and uh, let's get started. Okay, so exploring the models of pool adherence and strategies to overcome barriers. So... <clears throat> Does it feel good? You're not alone. So um, I think that um, um, adherence has been, has received a lot of attention lately for the past few years. And, and that's for a good reason. So the more we do cystic, the more we do research in cystic fibrosis and we find new therapies, uh, it's a good thing because we're improving survival and improving quality of life. However, the cost of increasing the complexity of the care is the increase in the burden of therapy, of treatment, and the decrease in the buy-in from patients. In other words, if you have CF and you're out there and you're trying to keep up with all your treatments and live your life normally, you might at some point say, the heck with it. I can do all these treatments. And as you do that, you might face some consequences. So let's look at this data. Um, presented at the last CF conference, and, and I'll guide you through it. Don't, don't get scared. I know like, it's a very technical slide, but um, I can help you to um, go through this. So medication possession ratio. So this is a term that it's used for access to medication. So basically, every time a patient goes and refills the medication, it's counted. So you have like really large numbers here with almost 2,000 patients or on each and then a little lower for other ones, but um, you can have an idea of the adherence per um, medication counted for each individual patient. So we're not even talking about the number that they actually took it, like the pill that they took it. We're talking about how many times they refill their medication. So that's the MPR, it's a measurement of adherence. Just keep it like that. So you look at this bar and you see the variation anywhere from 20 to 80%. That's how wide range the compliance or the adherence to that particular treatment is. So azithromycin is that pill that you take three times a week. It's that easy. But that's how much it fluctuates from 20 to 80. And then you move on to medications that you're probably very familiar with, the Pomozyme and the hypertonic saline, casein, colistin, and toby, and you see all this variation and then at the, at the end, you have um, the com composite, which is like basically the average of them all, and the average of 20 to 72%. And if we look at the white bar right in the middle, that's what we're looking at in terms of the average for that particular medication. Well, let's look at by age. Instead of each medication, we're making at the same count per age range. So 6 to 10 years old. Life is very close to perfect. Kids are, are 
pleasing their parents. They, they still want to please their parents. The parents are fully in charge of their medication. Adherence is great. You know, that bar is way up there. Now, if you look at the age between eight and eight, uh, 11 and 35, so that changes a little bit. So think of your life, 11 to 35. Life is really happening. You're in school, you're in high school, you're going to college, or you're getting a first job and family. So the priorities change. And there is also a change when you count the adherence. And then after 35, things get better a little bit for some, but you still see that wide range of variation. So if you focus on our goal today, if we look at the 11 into early 20s, you see the white line, the mean, and you see this down trajectory of um, adherence. It's almost like it's really hard to be adherent and then do the, all the treatments you need to do as you go through adolescence. So why do we care? Why is this important? So the impact of non-adherence. If we look, this study was published in 2011, and again, let's focus on the white line in the middle, and you look at the number of IV courses. So what exactly am I talking about? Basically hospital admissions, right? I mean, you can think of home IV, but this is really looking at home admissions. So, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, hospital admissions. So the less adherent you are to your treatments, the more courses of IV antibiotics you have. And then if you look at this different way to look at this data, they divided each patient group depending on their starting point with their lung function. So let's focus on the FEV1. You have a starting point of a little higher than two groups lower, and they're looking at medication possession ratio we just talked about, let's say above 80% and then less than 80%. Let's look at the green line. Granted that they have a starting point that it's a little bit higher to begin with, but there's no loss in lung function if they adhered more than 80%. And there was a decline, a significant decline, in their lung func function if they, last, if they have less than 80% of adherence. So this is another way to say that if you are not adherent, then you have more hospital admissions and you have a greater decline in lung function. How complicated can it be? So these are all the factors that we know has an impact, have an impact on adherence. So at an individual level, we um, age matters, health literacy, the knowledge of the disease and the treatment, mental health issues, health beliefs, health perceptions. So those are the individual factors that could count. At a family level, how structured your family is, what is the income, what again is the disease knowledge, health beliefs, coping styles, the quality of, or of your relationships at home, and how involved your family is in your care. And then at a health, at a healthcare level, we have, um, is it easy to access the CF clinic? Is it, it's how far it is? And how often, actually, frequency of, of clinic visits? So these are the things that count at a healthcare system level. And then at the end, your, even your community. So how is your neighborhood? What are the policies at school? And we go through a lot of that in, in clinics. So w what do we have to do um, to get the medications at lunchtime, for example? What is the peer support or the illness stigma? So that goes for your community. So that goes all within you know, determining how adherent you might be. So <laughs> mental health plays an important part in all of this. So this is just a pause on all of this data to, to point out um, how important this is. And this is Alexander Quinner have been collecting data on depression and cystic fibrosis for 12 years. And this is just a very brief summary of, of her data. So she basically screens uh, patients with CF 12 and older and also screen um, parents of CF patients for depression. And this is the alarming number of 22% of prevalence of depression among adolescents. So if this was 25, this is a one in every four adolescents with cystic fibrosis have depression. It is our responsibility as a CF center, you as a family member, and you, patient, even to recognize signs of depression. So there's something wrong with me. So, and ask, and come and ask for, for help. So this is a big, big problem. When we cross the data of adherence and depression, depression is a lot more prevalent among non-adherent patients, which makes sense. Right? So what can we do to support adherence? What can we all do? 
at a patient level or a family level or a CF, CF central level. So <clears throat> this is Michael Boyle. You've probably heard about him. He has a lot of webinars out there. So he is the director, he's a, the, the director of the adult CF program at Johns Hopkins. And he gave me some insight in this matter of understanding adherence. He had many uh, talks on this, uh, on this topic along the years. And, um, and I think understanding for me was a big part of, 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 of helping out your patients or patients who are struggling to keep up with their treatments. So they think of these patients as, um, is it lack of knowledge? Is it chaotic life? Or is it denial? So denial is a little bit more um, a little bit more complicated because it can have a mental health component to it. So it could be depression and I think the type of interventions that you need and um, are just a little bit more profound. But if the, the issues are the first two, I think there's a lot we can work with. There's a lot we can do. So information and education on, on treatments and treatment choices. This is really our job, and I'm looking at Dr. Keynes here. So it is the job of our, the CF Center to provide you with enough information or treatment choices so you can participate and be active when you ask, when you, when you uh, have a new treatment, or you're switching from one to the next. So you're entitled to ask for that information. It is our job to provide you this, this information. Um, it might be not the only thing that needs to be done, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's an essential part of adherence. You are more likely to follow instructions if you understand them. That's basically, this is what's saying. Um, chaotic life? Um, so chaotic life, this is um, when things get um, complicated, but I think we can also help. I think with the help of the, you know, the physicians and the social worker is to help the families to organize their lives and prioritize. I think that's like, you know, an important component. And we can discuss, uh, find a neutral time at home where you can have a realistic plan or expectation. So, mom, this is what I would like to do. This is what I would like to, this is what I can do. And what would be the ideal? And find that mid middle ground. Um, this has been done, and this was brought to um, my attention in, in clinic after this was discussed at home. So there's a lot we can do to help you through organizing your life as a CF center. So it's easy to remember too. Is it lack of knowledge, chaotic life, or denial? So what is the matter here? So what are the key components in this issue? So when we ask a patient, on a scale of one to 10, how important do you think it is to take your, your medications every day? So again, we're looking at that white line that it's the average of the data, and the white line on the adherent group is hidden on the top, but you can see that it's higher than the non-adherent group. Motivation, on a scale of one to 10, how motivated you are to take your medicines every day. And you can see a difference right there with the adherent and non-adherent group. And then self-advocacy. So this is basically talking about the confidence, how much you know about your disease. So on a scale one to 10, how confident you are, argue that you can take your medicine when, so I'm coughing more, I should increase my mucus clearance, or I should call my CF clinic and maybe ask for antibiotics. So how confident are you about these changes? And this is when you see the most different. So key components to the adherence, again, how important, recognizing the importance of your treatments, um, how motivated you are to improve, to feel better, to enjoy life, and how confident you are, and that involves the knowledge and um, the communication with your, your team. So Dr. Eakin is a psychologist from Johns Hopkins. And she has published a lot on, on this topic. And she actually has research that shows that children, and she's studying children transitioning to adult life. So this is what this research was about. And she states that children who know more, so knowledge, information, importance, know more about their medication and what they do, and who feel more confident in doing certain steps of their treatments, are going to be more likely to do their medications when they get older. So she's the first one to come front and say education is really important. Important, but maybe not enough. 
So we will talk about it in another you know, scientific slide, but I'll walk you through it. This is really important information. So this is one of the, the summaries from the Be In Charge trial, and I will be talking in a couple minutes about this trial. But this is basically saying a group of patients who um, were randomly assigned to just receive standard of care, just continue with the status quo. The second group received education on nutrition. So they are hammered with a lot of you know, caloric intake, type of cho choices of food and things like that, and they compare their outcome. Look at this. After six months and that after 12 months, there was a significant difference in terms of how much they knew. Did that make a difference in terms of their weight gain? It did not make a difference in the weight gain. You know a lot, but if it doesn't make a difference, what is it good for? They actually did similar studies using um, mucus clearance technique um, knowledge versus standard of care and the impact on FEV1, and there was none. Okay, so maybe education, is, it is an essential part of it, but it's not enough. What if we combine education with a behavioral uh, modification technique? Well, this is what they did on this one. They provide the same intense education to everybody, but they randomly assign a group of patients to receive education intervention. So that's the cognitive behavior therapy. And this is really uh, interesting. I'll go into a little bit more because this was a younger group of patients, 4 to 12 years old, with less than 40th percentile for uh, BMI, so they are undernourished. And um, they, were, uh, they received techniques in how to modify their behaviors, and I'll explain to you how they did that, so kids and parents separately. And, and this is what was the, basically the result. So this is after 12 months and then after 24 months. Look at the impact of caloric intake. It was significant. The group who received both behavioral education compared to the group who just received education, they had an increased caloric intake. And not only that, they had weight gain. Okay, so we're getting somewhere here, okay. So what are the barriers? So what is in the way of doing everything you need to do? Well, burden of treatment, it's a lot. It's a lot that each one of you have to do on a daily basis, yes? Okay, you can attest to that. Social and work demands. Life is happening. I want to go out with my friends. I have a boyfriend or whatever it is. Forgetfulness. You can just forget. Not perceived health benefits. That's the one that it's, it's, it's hard for me to hear because we want everything that we prescribe to have a great impact in your life, but that's not always the case, right? Fatigue. You're exhausted because you're going to school and you have to fit in all these other things. Then embarrassment related to performing treatments in public. So these are all the barriers that we know of. And I, I don't know, I don't want to overwhelm you with all of this, but these are all the things that we know it may make a difference in terms of the tools that you might have. So education we just talked about. What about reminders on your phone and problem solving and social support and parent training and family therapy? Instead of going through all the options, what we are going today, doing today in our breakout sessions is focused on three main ones. So Dr. Lara Bava will lead the discussion. We have moderators for the breakout sessions. We'll work on communication. If you can communicate better with your child and you with your parents, um, is it life will be easier? Can we find that neutral time and do some planning? Not when we're hungry, in a hurry, or upset. A neutral time. Even knowing to recognize what a neutral time is. So this will be one of the things we'll discuss. Then, um, communication is a big one. Planning. What is a realistic schedule? Send an email to your physician. Is this an okay plan? As, as we've done here before. And, and the third one is some parenting tips in how to keep it positive. Positive reinforcement, as I learned from Dr. King's, goes a long way. And it can, can get a lot more done when you use that positive spin on things. And another really important thing in terms of parenting skills, keeping it consistent. Yes, we have a great plan. Can we keep it, can, can we keep it, you know, can we keep it consistent? So, okay. What doesn't work? Nagging. <gasps> then we love to do that. And we do too. Physicians do too. And guess what? It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Um, yelling and screaming. We do not want this happened at home. 
First of all, it's not effective. It doesn't work. Second, it makes everybody unhappy. So this is what we don't want to do. So let me just go through some ongoing trials, just so you have an idea how much time, energy, and investment there's all over, there's going on all over the place in terms of adherence. So you can just have a sense of how important this is. Let's talk about balance, the big name. So building adherence to live with and navigate my cystic fibrosis experience. This is an ongoing trial, and it's not recruiting anymore. It only involved adults, and it's sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University and the NIH. And this is a, uh, they actually at Johns Hopkins, they have a whole department devoted to um, adherence, and cystic fibrosis is just part of that. And they are looking at comparing, again, standard of care, just a group of patients receiving standard of care, and a randomly selected group receiving motivational interviewing focused intervention. So motivational interviewing focused interventions, the type of interventions. And, I, and, and the psychologists and the social workers in the room probably will have more details about this type of technique. But in a nutshell, is a, it's a positive reinforcement type of technique where you start your conversations using things that you as a patient or a family like to do and things that you're actually doing right. And you start from there and you build from there in how to improve it. So it's fascinating and I think I'm anxious to see the results of this trial. The next one is eye care. Eye change adherence to raise expectations. It's a CF Foundation funded study and exactly at the target group of 11 to 12 years old. And again, it's comparing the standard of care with this randomly assigned group of patients with two types of intervention. One is an easy, kind of easy one. It's looking at that medication possession ratio that we we're just talking about. So basically giving that information to CF care providers in terms of how often your patient is actually refilling your, their medications. Just by doing that, the CF team, it triggers like a bunch of reactions on us, knowing that, you know what, the last time that this was refilled was six months ago, so there's no way that this patient is actually doing what they need to do. Just by providing that information, I think it's, uh, it, it will probably make a difference. On a smaller group of patients, they are actually planning a more complex um, assessment and program, adherence program. So basically assessing knowledge, skills in performing treatment, uh, modification um, behavioral um, interventions, problem solving, and barriers to adherence. So this will be fascinating to share with you what the results of this trial will be as well. This is the CF phone. This is, I think it's a like very simple idea and very um, easy to uh, participate. They're looking at a group with no access to social networking and a group that actually access this type of services. Anybody with CF, if you Google CF phone, this will come up and you can sign up and actually talk to other patients all over the world with CF and find support just by networking with them. So we'll see if that will have an impact. And the last one, um, this is a, a younger age group, but I think it's extremely relevant for, for all of us. And it's the Be In Charge Behavior Intervention for Change Around Growth and Energy. So these are basically behavior strategies um, combined with nutrition information for increasing the energy intake and growth rates of children with CF. So this, this again, it's like a four to 12 age group, and the parents and kids assist different seminars. So they come in, and the parents will go in a room, and they're going to receive information about diet, and they're going to um, learn how to use track devices in terms of caloric intake, and, um, and one strategy at a time, one meal at a time, learn how to deal with the difficult issues. The kids will go to a fun room, or they're going to play interactive games, where they will associate a higher caloric intake with more energy and energy with play. So it's all about rewards, again, positive reinforcement. In terms, when it comes to bad behaviors, they will teach them to ignore, depending on the level of the bad behavior, if it's just like dwelling with meals, for example. So they will just basically say, ignore that, or create some boundaries and rules in, of the unwanted behavior. So we already looked at some graphs, the bar graphs, so how, what's the impact, and uh, we know that they already, are, they're already kind of publishing and coming up with some great results of this comprehensive um, intervention for nutrition. What are the tools, cool tools are there? So applications, so believe it or not, 
um, there is an investment on that, uh, developing applications, and we can um, understand that because it's so appealing <laughs> and it's convenient and it's cheap and easy to disseminate. So the one they're working right now, it's called the CF phone, um, the CF notebook. So it's a diary function where this is, will be your screen on your iPad or on your iPhone and they can have, they keep track of, you know, their medications, how often they are exercising, they are, um, even FEV1, blood sugars. And an example of this will be the medication that they are on and their schedule. And the interesting thing about this, uh, the, the CF notebook is that it gives this idea, concept of personalized um, feedback. So you can put in actually your FAV1 every time you do a PFT and then you can mark when you start a new therapy. And, and you do that and you can keep, you know, you can track your, your progress. So I think that's, that's very, um, would be very interesting. And I just checked last night to see if there was anything um, already available for download, not yet. It says that it's still in prep. So what works? So according to Dr. Eakin, we know what works, <coughs> written contracts. And this is an example of it. So no Facebook time or no car on Friday. If you don't do, what's in this contract, okay? And then the parent, on the other hand, kids at home, please, you know, this is part of the contract, they would not nag. So that's the deal. It's, the interesting thing about what Dr. Eakin shared with us is that the parent is the first one to sabotage the agreement. I don't know if that sounds anything familiar, what you go through, but they're not really willing to enforce the consequence or stop the nagging. So then it's the teenager, you guys, they get, you know, they get lost, they don't know what to do. So then they keep acting out more and more. So it's very frustrating. What we know also works is regular visits to their CF clinic and feedback and support from the physician. So they reported feeling amped up to their therapies after each clinic visit. And they perceive the time in the CF clinic as a positive experience that reinforced their efforts to stay on track. So in other words, what works? Mutual commitment and come to your appointments. So this is our message right now, for now. And um, I would like to just to close uh, with this quote from uh, John Wooden. He is, was like a UCLA basketball coach and he's in the member of the Bas Basketball um, Hall of Fame. And he says that the worst thing you can do for someone you love is to do that which they could and should do for themselves. Thank you.